welcome everybody to join this presentation. I'm uh, very happy to introduce you to Dr. Joey Enzer, who is a lecturer in medical statistics at Kiel University, where he works primarily within the Center for Prognosis Research. And uh, Joey's research interests focus on methodological advantages in prediction modeling, model validation, individual patient data, meta-analysis and diagnostic test elevation, but he's also interested in sample size calculation for prediction modeling. And that's where he will, uh, where we get a presentation from him about building and validating prediction models and an overview of sample size guidance and the PM sample size package. So I'm very excited to listen to this talk and I think we can start. So I will hand over to you, Joy. Uh, just one thing, we record this presentation. So if you do not want to, you might want to switch off your uh, camera if you don't want to be recorded. You can uh, ask questions either directly after the presentation or you can add them in the chat forum and we will ask, I will ask, uh, uh, read them to Joy after his presentation. Okay, thank you. Joey, it's your turn now. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is um, Joey Enzo, and I work at Kiel, as I said. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, developing and uh, validating prediction models, and particularly about sample size guidance for that, um, and my PM sample size package to implement some guidance that we've developed. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Gary Collins and Richard Riley. Um, this uh, seminar is very much based on um, on things that we give on our prediction modeling course uh, at Keele University. So to start, um, I'm going to give a, a very brief whistle stop tour of clinical prediction models. Um, I'm not sure the, the level of knowledge on prediction models in the audience, so a brief overview of prediction models and then start to talk about the background to sample size and what people have done in the past and then introduce our proposed methodology um, and I will be equation light uh, so it's, it's a bit more friendly um, and then I will showcase PM sample size in action so using the methods um, in action in examples using diagnostic and prognostic models. I'll briefly talk about some issues that arise from our proposal and some future work and finish with the take home messages from the talk. So very briefly, uh, clinical prediction models uh, aim to give us individualized risk predictions for a particular outcome for a particular disease or condition. And they're usually uh, multivariable, so they take in multiple characteristics of patients. They might be genetic, um, or they might be basic patient characteristics like sex and age. And these individualized predictions are really useful for a number of reasons uh, in terms of guiding treatment decisions, uh, cost effective analyses, all sorts of things. Uh, really useful and also really popular thing to do nowadays is develop a prediction model. So very briefly, the outline of um, the stages of clinical prediction model research we start with uh, what we call model development, where we decide which variables or characteristics of patients will enter the model to, to allow us to make a prediction. We also consider how we're going to model those variables, so maybe nonlinear functions um, we might be interested in. So, and this is uh, the phase that I'm really going to focus on in this talk, because this is where things can go really wrong. So I'm going to focus on sample size for development. Really, the next phase in terms of validation can be considered model development. It's, it's one in the same and it should always accompany a model, de a model development. <clears throat> and at the internal validation stage, we assess the model's uh, validity in terms of accuracy and performance in the same population uh, that we use to develop it. And we do this using techniques like bootstrapping or cross validation. And then we can measure optimism in our model development process and adjust for that optimism. Then we move on to externally validate our model in new patients 
So um, we look to assess the potential performance of the model um, accurately, whether it can accurately predict individuals' risks in new target populations, and whether it's generalizable to different populations. And if we've got time, I'll talk a bit about sample size for external validation as well. And finally, um, fairly rare is impact assessment. So this is where we take the model forwards to assess um, how much it actually improves patient outcomes when we use it in practice. So again, this is just a very brief introduction, just the groundwork that I need to be able to talk to you about the sample size uh, calculations. So what does a, a prediction model look like? Well, if we have a binary outcome, then we might be fitting a logistic regression model. Um, so we'll be predicting the uh, probability on the logic scale. And the bit that I'm interested in, in everyone uh, following is the linear predictor. So this is the combination of those characteristics that enter the model. So we've got an alpha term, which is an intercept, which gives us our um, prediction for the for the average patient with average values in all the predictors and we've got individual characteristics that have entered the model so here we've got age and sex and hypertension anything to say genetic factors etc similarly for a uh, continuous outcome where we we might be fitting a linear regression model we again have this um, I've shifted slightly but this uh, part on the right hand side of the equation represents our linear predictor. So this combination of our um, alpha intercept term and the betas with the uh, covariates that represent patient characteristics. So the key thing here is, is the linear predictor. Sorry, I should say that if, we, if we're also talking about time to event models, then it's slightly more complicated, but a similar thing applies where the linear predictor or prognostic index, as it's sometimes called, is the combination of the betas um, and the characteristics, just excluding the, the baseline element in the time to event model. So the thing is, once we've developed the model, uh, we, we are able to make predictions for individuals through some transformation of that linear predictor. But that's not the end of the story because we need to identify how reliable those, pred those predictions are in terms of um, how accurate they are and generalizable they are. And there are many ways that we can measure the performance of the model. So um, particular, particularly important one is calibration, often ignored in the literature, uh, but this is really measuring how accurately does my model predict for individuals. So um, we might look at statistics like the calibration slope, um, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Discrimination is a very uh, common one that we might look at. Um, and we're asking ourselves, how well does the model discriminate between those that had an event and those that did not have an event? So have an event. So how well can the model separate those people in terms of their risk? Uh, and a really commonly reported statistic there is the C statistic or the area under the rock curve. And finally, we might look at overall performance, which is a kind of amalgamation of both of those concepts of accurate prediction and discrimination. Um, and in particular for this talk, I'm really interested in the R squared, which is essentially the proportion of explained variation by the model. So, as I said, R squared basically gives us the percentage of variation in the Y values that's explained by my model. So here in this um, little diagram example, we can see on the y-axis we've got the observed pain score and on the x-axis the predicted pain scores. So our model is predicting pain and essentially we're asking how well um, can we predict that observed value on the y-axis. So we'd like to see these points lying on that x-y line. This is the training data set. So we can see here um, that R squared is, is fairly high, so actually in this case it was about 70%. In the uh, test data set, you can see it's a bit more scattered, um, a bit worse, and in this case it was about 40%. So it's just a measure of explained variation. And I'm going to talk about optimism just in, in a moment, but we, we 
can also have an adjusted version of R squared, which is important for our sample size calculations. Now, R squared um, should be familiar to many, and that is based on a simple linear regression. If we're talking about binary or times of event models, then we can't use R squared anymore. We uh, need to use a pseudo R squared. So again, we're trying to measure this um, proportion of variation explained. But now we're interested in something called the Cox Snell R squared. I don't want to get into the, the technicalities of it, um, but it's trying to measure the same thing. Um, and I'm going to talk more about Cox and R squared when we talk about the sample size uh, calculations. But another one that I'll mention is Nagel Kirky's R squared. So Nagel Kirky proposed um, to scale the Cox and R squared because Cox and R squared naturally has a maximum that is less than one. And so that doesn't help us in interpreting R squared in the same way we do from a simple linear regression. So the Nagel Kirky's R squared just scales it so that we're back to a, a zero one. Um, scale so we can interpret in a similar way to the R squared from a linear regression. So I also need to briefly talk about optimism uh, before we move on to sample size. So we talked about the phases of um, clinical prediction model research and when we develop our model we can calculate the performance statistics in our development data but we know that those performance statistics are likely to be too large, are likely to be optimistic. And we call this the apparent performance of the model when we validate within the same data in which we built. We call this the apparent performance. And this is likely to be optimistic because in the same data that we've developed the model, the model is likely to be overfitted, particularly if we've done things like selection procedures to decide on which characteristics will enter the model. We might have ended up in situations where we could have missed um, important variables. We could have unimportant variables included in the model by chance. And we could have um, inappropriate predictor effects. So the betas that go with those predictors could be inflated. So the model will likely be overfitted in some way. And we need a way to adjust for that. So we do something called shrinkage. So here I've got uh, an example of a couple of uh, calibration plots. So similar to what we saw with the um, R squared plots, again, on the Y axis, we've got observed risk and on the X axis, predicted risk. And we hope that our predictions are an accurate reflection of our observed values. So we hope that they will lie on this X, Y line. And this is what we should see when we do a model development. The model should perfectly fit um, and be accurate. So we should see um, our predictions lying on this X, Y line. And <clears throat> we measure that using something called the calibration slope. And in, if we do have predictions on the 45 degree line, then we'll have a calibration slope of one. However, more often than not, when we uh, assess whether we've got any optimism in the model, we see a, a calibration plot looking something a bit more like this bottom one here. Um, and so we can see here that we've got quite a lot of variation in our predicted risks. So um, our predictions are too close to zero and one across the risk spectrum. Apologies if I <coughs> struggle with my throat. Uh, my two-year-old is a plague upon our house at the moment. Um, yes, yeah, so in the, in the top plot, we've got perfect calibration, so with one. In the bottom plot, we've got some optimism, and this is likely due to overfitting. So our predicted risks are too low in the lower region of the plot and are too high in the upper region of the plot. So we're not accurately matching our observed risks. And we want to do something about this um, <coughs> because they're, they're too extreme. So we need to do something called shrinkage. And we can correct for this using the shrinkage factor, which is essentially that uh, calibration slope. So I said that our calibration slope would be one in a perfect scenario. It would be less than one in a situation where we're fitting. And if we multiply the beta coefficients, so the linear predictor that I described earlier, by this calibration slope, then we can address this and pull this curve back towards perfect. <clears throat> 
<coughs> so I'll push on to sample size. So obviously, as as in any study, um, not just in prediction modeling, sample size is really important um, when we're designing any study. In terms of prediction modeling, it's important when we're looking to um, prospectively collect patients in order to develop a model. We're asking ourselves, how many patients do we need to collect in order to build an adequate model to accurately predict individuals' risk? <coughs> and it's also important if we're in a situation where we have an existing data set. Again, we're asking ourselves, is the data that we have to hand large enough to build an adequate model? And also, given the size of data that I have, how many potential predictors could I consider to include in this model? And just to um, highlight that this is an important issue, uh, this is a snippet from the tripod guidelines. So this is uh, guidelines for transparent reporting of um, clinical prediction models. And we can see here item eight, explain how the study sample size was arrived at. So it's really crucial both in development and validation. So what do we want in an ideal world? Well, it's slightly different whether we're thinking about developing the model or validating the model. So if we're looking to develop a model, what we really want is to have a large enough sample size to develop a model that predicts as accurately as possible. Whereas when we're validating a model, we're interested in having a large enough sample size to accurately and precisely estimate the performance of that model in new patients. As I said, in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on development because that's where most things can go wrong. And I've just got a note here to say that it's really important that we have as much data as possible to develop a good model. Often we see in the literature um, people splitting their data set into a development and a validation data set. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to note that validation isn't, isn't everything. Having a good model development is important. It will reduce the chance of overfitting. And if we split to have a validation data set, it's likely that that validation will be inadequate. We won't have a high enough sample size for that validation. So, <clears throat> as I said, I'm going to focus on model development because that's the real danger. That's the real um, place where we can go wrong. And there's potential problems with small sample sizes. So, first of all, as briefly mentioned, we can end up with spurious predictor outcome associations. And what do I mean by this? So, I mean that we could <coughs> miss some really important predictors through using selection processes, which is just based on p-values. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, or we could actually include predictors that are unimportant. So this again will lead to overfitting. And then that in, in, in turn would lead to poor performance in new data. I also mentioned that we could end up with coefficients that are um, imprecisely estimated and potentially inflated. And therefore, again, predictions from the model are likely to be too extreme. So again, we'll see calibration plot with that very wiggly line showing overfitting in our new data set when we go to validate and use our model in new patients. So this is where the real <coughs> problems are, is in development. So what have people done in the past? Well, quite a lot of papers in the past on um, what we should do to estimate sample size for building a model. Um, and also more recently, uh, some papers looking at how bad some of those proposals were. So <clears throat> a lot of those proposals in the past were based on events per variable, um, which some of you may have heard of. And EPV is being used historically uh, as an indicator of the effective sample size. And I say effective um, in bold here because it's completely driven by events. It's ignoring total sample size and treats 
uh, any sample size calculation as if it's only based on a subset of your population, just the events. Um, and it's essentially the ratio of the events divided by the number of candidate predictors <coughs> that you're looking to uh, select for your model. <coughs> APV traditionally for logistic regression was based on a minimum of events and non-events. Whereas for time to event, was based on the number of failures, so deaths. In linear regression, we talk about subjects per variable, so SPV, but that's slightly different. So as I say, historically, it's been used um, very commonly in guiding the sample size needed or the number of predictors you could look at, depending on whether you're doing a prospective or whether you've also got a data set to hand to build a model. I just want to highlight here as well that candidate predictors <coughs> means that this denominator should be um, include all variables that you're going to consider in the modeling process. So if you're planning to do screening, it needs to be all the predictors. So that's another um, flaw of the, of the uh, system. I personally would prefer to call it EPP. So um, APV essentially means um, the number of non-intercept parameters that are going to be included in the model. And <clears throat> most of the time, the number of terms in the model, the number of parameters to estimate in the model will be greater than the number of variables. So for example, if we've got a categorical variable with four categories, we've got three degrees of freedom, and therefore three parameters that we need to estimate. So I'd rather call it uh, EPP, events per parameter, or subjects per parameter if we're thinking about linear regression. So um, what value of EPV has been proposed? Well, lots of studies, lots of simulations, those who propose different, uh, anywhere from as low as EPV5 up to EPV50. Um, a number of studies uh, didn't give a, a specific EPV, but the one rule to rule them all has been historically EPV10. And um, I use this image because it, it is an evil rule, um, just like Sauron himself, and also like Sauron, he needs to be killed multiple times. Um, and this essentially comes from the Paduzzi paper uh, in 1996. And there was basically no real rationale in that paper as to why they uh, honed in on this EPV10 as a rule. But really, it's because it's, it's an easy calculation, isn't it? So now I can say easily the number of events I need, so the sample size that I need is simply the parameters times 10. And we can all multiply by 10. Otherwise, there's absolutely no uh, rationale. <clears throat> uh, and that has been shown in recent studies by um, Martin Van Sven and others. So we've got this no rationale um, paper here and moving beyond events per variable criteria paper. <clears throat> and this makes perfect sense because, as I say, we've got lots of studies that have given different rules for EPV, but why would one size fit all? Why would why would that be the case? It doesn't make any sense. Um, no one goes around saying that, for example, for um, randomized controlled trials, that you should always have 100 patients in each arm, regardless of the target population, regardless of the treatment, regardless of the condition we're interested in. And it makes perfect sense that sample size should be tailored to the problem. And that's the, the root of our um, methodology, is that we're looking for a tailored sample size calculation. <coughs> so now I'm going to move beyond APV. So, <coughs> sorry, we're not the only ones that have been looking to move beyond APV. So there are a few papers uh, in the literature now that have looked at methods to go uh, further than APV. So we've got this paper by Pablo, um, Valentine de Jong, Evangelina Christen Lu, and then we've got two papers that we published in Statistics in Medicine. And I'm going to hone in on these papers because uh, these are the methods that um, our group developed, and also because these methods are uh, implemented in my PM sample size package and so uh, easily usable in practice. 
So our proposal uh, for model development is to calculate sample size to minimize potential overfitting in our, in our model and to estimate particular parameters precisely. So particularly uh, the overall risk of the intercepts in the model. And we propose a series of closed form solutions to compute the sample size needed to precisely estimate these measures. <coughs> and we do this for uh, linear logistic and pulse regression, so continuous binary and time to event outcomes. And this work really builds on earlier work of Frank Curl. So uh, I'm going to break this down for continuous outcomes and then for binary and time to event outcomes. So we have a series of criteria that we must meet to identify the sample size required. So to minimize overfitting, we need to calculate a sample size that would allow us to have a heuristic shrinkage factor greater than 0 0.9. So that means we need less than 10% shrinkage in our model. So we're looking for very little overfitting <coughs> when we develop the model. The thing is, we're looking for a sample size that means we have a small difference in the apparent and adjusted R squared. So the apparent R squared is that uh, value that we know is optimistic. So the R squared that we measure when we test the model we built in the data we built it in. We know that apparent performance will be optimistic. And so we do some form of internal validation like a bootstrap procedure and we estimate the potential optimism. And then we can calculate an adjusted R squared. So usually that will be uh, slightly smaller than the apparent R squared because we, we shrink it down. So we're looking for a small difference <coughs> between our apparent and adjusted performance measures. And this again, like criteria one, means that we're targeting small overfitting in the model, small optimism in performance. And then the third and fourth criteria that we're looking is for precise estimation of particular parameters in the model. So specifically, we want to make sure that our overall average outcome value is precisely estimated and that the residual standard deviation around that is precisely estimated. Now, in terms of average outcome value, um, this is akin to uh, precisely estimating the intercept of the model if all the other parameters in the model were incentives. And in terms of residual standard deviation, this is important to precisely estimate because this is involved in the computation of R squared. So by precise estimation, I mean um, narrow confidence intervals around those um, parameters. And it's important for me to note that I will calculate the sample size that meets each of these four criteria. And so that sample size could be different across these four criteria. And then I will take the maximum value of those four sample sizes. And I'll treat that as the minimum sample size I should collect. If I take the maximum of these four, then I will always meet the other three criteria. Of binary and time to event outcomes, again, it's a series of criteria to meet. So uh, the first two are very much the same. So we're looking to target minimal overfitting with a, with a, a large uh, shrinkage. Uh, less than 10% um, shrinkage required, and we're looking for a small difference in the performance uh, between the apparent and adjusted. The last thing is again targeting precise estimation of the overall risk. So if we're talking about binary outcome, this is <coughs> directly related to the prevalence, for instance, and if we're talking about a time to event model, then this really depends on the time that you're looking to make a prediction at. And again, I'll take the maximum sample size calculated from these criteria, and that would be my minimum I hope to collect in my study to develop the model. So in the um, papers uh, that were on the earlier slide, there was uh, clippings for those papers. Uh, there's loads of formula, as I said, I don't want to go into all the formula, but loads of formula to calculate these criteria. Um, thankfully, it's all coded into the software that I'll get to in a moment. Um, but you'll see that there's a number of things that we need to specify. So we need to specify the number of predictor parameters that we're, that we're looking to consider. So uh, that would be 
looking for, we need to specify our desired shrinkage factor. So we pre-specify a shrinkage factor of 0.9. We think really it should be 0.9 or higher. And I'll talk about that at the end as well. Um, we need to specify the overall risk in the population for our binary or time to event or the average outcome value for a continuous model, the residual standard deviation for a continuous model. And the, the tricky one is the models anticipated R squared or Cox now R squared if we're talking about a binary time to event model. So this is uh, the performance that we hope to achieve with our newly developed model. And most of these things we can um, derive from previous studies and existing models in your um, field, such as the overall risk and the predictive performance. We, we can usually derive this information from existing information just as with our sample size calculations for RCTs. And the tricky one is, is this anticipated performance. So we need R squared and we've got our normal, uh, our regular R squared for linear models over here. And that's over here because normally if there's an R squared, uh, if there's a prediction model existing in the field that has a continuous outcome, they will have presented R squared. So we'll be able to obtain that fairly easily. If we don't have an existing model, then again, we can interpret R squared quite easily. And so we might be able to um, decide with clinical input what we might expect the R squared to be from our new model development. It's a lot more complicated for the binary and time to event setting where we're looking for a Cox Snell R squared. <clears throat> so remember, this is uh, a similar idea to the R squared, so explain variation but for a binary or time to event outcome. And to get to that Cox and R squared, which may not have been reported in existing models, we've got a whole load of other R squareds and ways to get there. So all of these um, can be used to find your way through the maze to a Cox and R squared. So we can use the nagel kirkis R squared, which uh, I already described is just a scaling of the Cox Snell. We can use the McFadden's R squared or a Quigley R squared, Royston's R squared. And we can use Royston's D if we're talking about time to event models. And finally, we can use the C statistic, whether we're talking about time to event or binary outcomes. So as I say, all of these will uh, find their way through the maze to get to the Cox and R squared. So there, there is usually a way for us to get the parameter we need for our sample size calculation. Uh, the most commonly reported statistic will be the C statistic or the error under the rock curve. And actually, um, this paper, this uh, notes published by uh, Richard and Gary and, and Ben Van Kolster, um, showed how to derive an approximate Cox and R squared from using a reported C statistic. We used a, uh, a simulation approach. And um, if you're interested, then, then please ask me and I, I can describe how that works. Um, and that is now implemented in PM sample size as well, as I'll illustrate in the examples. So that makes it a little bit easier because, as I say, this is most often what you'll see in papers rather than this. But I can now uh, calculate that inside the program using this awesome uh, little trick. So I should also note that the Cox and L R squared, as I said um, at the start, doesn't have a maximum value of one. Its, it's maximum value will be less. And the, Cox, the maximum value of our Cox and R squared is defined using this um, simple formula. This just means that when we're inputting values into our sample size calculation, we need to be careful to be realistic about that Cox and R squared and not to interpret it as an Agro-Kirky R squared or, or a standard R squared for a linear regression. So for example, if we've got a linear regression model, and we've got an outcome proportion of 50%, and then the maximum R squared we could achieve is actually 0.75. If we've got an outcome proportion of 5% or 1%, it's actually much lower. So the maximum um, Cox and R squared we could achieve is 0.33 or 0.11. So it's a lot lower. And now if we want to think about R squared in terms of nagel kirky R squared, we need to think of it as a proportion of this maximum. So <clears throat> I'm sure I can I can hear your thoughts and I can hear some people saying, but what if there isn't a model that exists in my field that I could use to base my calculations on? 
Um, well, first of all, I'd say think again, look again, because it, it's probably it's pretty rare. There are prediction models in all field, m most fields now. So, so have a look again. Um, but if there really isn't anything, if this is going to be the first model developed for this condition, um, then uh, as a kind of guide, as a kind of um, yeah, a guide, we suggest using a Nagelkirk as R squared of about 15% explained variation. Um, and this is because generally in healthcare, most outcomes are what we call low signal to noise ratio. And so it's really common for us to see a Nagelkirk as R squared between 0.1 and 0.2. So even 15% even is, is giving some here. Maybe <clears throat> input 10% explained variation into the calculation to get a real conservative estimate of the sample size that you need to build your model. There are, as with any rules, an exception to this uh, to this guideline, and that would be if you're going to input predictors into your model that you know are really strongly related with the outcome. So if we're looking to um, predict blood pressure and we input an earlier blood pressure measurement, then we know there's a mechanistic relationship and we might actually want to input a value much higher than that, like 50% maybe explained variation. But be cautious and as with any sample size calculation, we'll try a range of values. So now I'm going to uh, talk about PM sample size and uh, just show some examples of the methodology in practice. So PM sample size implements our proposed methodology for all the outcomes, so continuous, binary, time to event outcomes. It's implemented in both Stata and R. Um, I try to keep both. Uh, in, in line with each other so they're both continuously updated. <clears throat> and the great thing about it is because it's all based on closed form solutions, it's incredibly fast. So this is a, uh, a, a snapshot of the help file. Uh, this is the help file in Stata, but it's, it's very similar in R. So it's quite, uh, it's quite a lot of information in there. Um, and this is just about the parameters that we can input into the into the software. So the type is the is the key one. So this is telling the program what type of model you've got, a continuous outcome, a binary outcome, etc. Shrinkage always needs to be specified. So this is one that I've highlighted because we set a default. So we say at least a shrinkage of 0.9. But again, that could be higher. We have um, R squared and parameters. So R squared is that expected uh, value of the, the Cox nail or the R squared for linear regression that we expect the performance of our new model to, to be. So when we input that, we should be conservative. And importantly as well, if we're looking at an existing model, be careful as to whether they've presented the apparent performance or the adjusted. If they've presented the apparent, then we need to then adjust that. So we're putting in a optimism adjusted value as our baseline. Um, parameters, the number of parameters we um, want to assess in our model. These are um, options for time to event models. So, so the event rate, uh, the mean follow up over time and the time point that we're looking to predict that. These are the parameters for continuous outcomes. So remember, we want to precisely estimate the intercept and the residual standard deviation. And this is the precision that we want around that. So again, we pre-specified uh, 10% margin of error around these parameters. And finally, we've got parameters for a binary outcome. So the prevalence drives a lot of it. And now we've also got the C statistic option where we can, uh, inside the program, estimate the Cox nil R squared from a reported C statistic. And that requires a little bit of simulation. So there's also a seed there. Um, not very randomly selected, but you can input the seed you want. <clears throat> so let's look at an example. Uh, this is a continuous uh, outcome. So this is looking to develop a new model to predict lung function in African Americans. And this is um, using characteristics from this existing article that developed a model. So I'm going to start just with live code. So uh, I would type PM sample size. I'm looking at a continuous model, so type C. Uh, they reported a R squared of 0.2. So that will be the lower bound for what I, I hope my model would be better than that when I develop it, but that will be a lower bound for what I, I expect 
to get from my new developed model. I've got 25 candidate predictors I'm interested in, um, in looking at. And these are the population mean and standard deviation values for the outcome. So that, uh, the outcome in this case is lung function FEV1. <clears throat> and these were reported in the paper on the previous slide. And we've got a section of um, assumptions and, and preset parameters. So this is just to make clear that um, I've set this acceptable difference that I'm looking for in my apparent adjusted R squared. So that's criteria two. Uh, I've set this acceptable difference at 0.05. I'm assuming this 10% margin of error in my estimation of the intercept and standard deviation. Then we've got our output. So we've got a sample size calculated for each of our four criteria. Just highlighted that um, we've got the subjects per parameter. To be honest, uh, I hate this and I hate EPV, but it's there just to illustrate that those rules are garbage. And, um, and you'll see when we move on to the binary example that EPV could be much higher or much lower than the rule of 10. Um, it's, it's garbage. So we can see here that um, criteria one went out. So we can see final sample size should be 918 patients to develop a model for this example. Um, and that means we get a shrinkage of 0 0.9, 25 parameters that I wanted to investigate, R squared of 0.2. I've got a summary of information here. This is the, the precision around my intercept uh, if I had that sample of 900. So now a uh, diagnostic prediction model um, looking to predict uh, presence or absence of Chagas disease based on this paper. This is an example from R, so this is the R output. Again, we've got our, our type B for a binary. We've got a lower bound, which is estimated from that paper um, of our Cox and R squared, 0.28. 24 parameters I wanted to look at and a outcome prevalence of 17.4%. Here again, a summary of the assumptions uh, for the calculations. We've got EPP on the end here, and we can see it's much lower than the 10, uh, than the rule of 10. And we've got our final sample size, uh, which was uh, achieved by criteria two, in this case, 662 patients required. And we can see that that means, based on a prevalence of 17.4%, that we need 116 events. So criteria two went out here. So that's the uh, small difference in our apparent and adjusted performance of our model. And that actually meant that we needed a shrinkage slightly higher than 0.9. So 0 0.905 to achieve that value. You can also see that uh, we've got the max R squared in the output. So this is the maximum that the Cox now R squared can reach given this example and these parameters. And also the Nagel Kirke R squared given the input Cox Snell R squared. So in this case, our input parameters mean that we're assuming that we're going to get an explained variation around 47.7%. <clears throat> so you can play with that with different inputs so that you can identify the max uh, Cox Snell R squared and what you would like your Nag uh, Nagel Kirke's R squared to be. Yeah, we can see criteria two one out. Now I'm just going to um, show an example where we didn't have a published Cox and LR squared and instead we had a C statistic. So this is a diagnostic prediction model for the presence or absence of deep vein thrombosis based on this paper by Thomas Debray. And in it they have a, um, a calibration plot on which they present the C statistic, so 0.79. So we can use that in our calculation. So now we input PM sample size, type binary, C statistic input from that paper. We're interested in looking at seven predicted parameters this time. And we've got a prevalence again identified from that study of 22%. Um, so we can see here that the program goes off and calculates based on that input C statistic and that prevalence. We get an estimated Cox and R squared of 0 0.189. And that filters through, <coughs> filters through to the program here. So this is our Cox and R squared, our maximum Cox Snell R squared is 0.65, giving us a Nagel Kirke R squared of 0.278. Criteria one wins out here. So more often than not, um, from our experience so far, 
criteria one, which is looking for uh, small shrinkage, wins out. So this requires 312 patients with 69 events, given the um, input prevalence of 22%. And again, we can see here EPP 9.8. So by chance, very close to the 10 rule there. But again, like I said, it's garbage. Um, so I should highlight that um, these, this final sample size that comes out is a minimum. So that's the minimum we should get. And in fact, there might be other criteria that you might be interested in that could inflate that sample size further. <clears throat> and there's a nice example in uh, our Stats and Med paper that illustrates where actually we did need a larger sample size if we started to look at the precision around certain predictor effects. So it could be really laborious to, to do that if we've got lots of predictors in the model, but it may be that we could be interested in precision in predictors beyond just that intercept, that, that overall risk. We definitely want that overall risk to be right, but there could be certain predictors that we want to investigate, maybe predictors with low variance or, or low prevalence in or events in particular categories, and that can inflate the sample size further. But it, it's quite laborious to um, to calculate the sample size you'd require to achieve certain confidence intervals around particular parameters. Also, briefly, the the timing of data collection. So, uh, as I said, we might be <coughs> We might have an existing data set to hand, or we might be looking to collect patients um, to develop the model. Uh, if we're looking to prospectively collect patients to develop a model, um, and we can anticipate what the expected sample size and proportion of events will be, then we can limit the potential number of variables and parameters we need to estimate. Uh, if we know beforehand how many predictors we're looking to examine, then we can instead um, adjust the sample size that we need so we can uh, keep collecting patients until we get to a suitable sample size to, to assess the predictors we want to assess. Conversely, if we've got an existing data set to hand, then our sample size and obviously our number of events are fixed in place. And so then the only thing we could do is restrict the number of variables or parameters that we're interested in looking at, maybe not look at nonlinear trends or things like that. Um, and this is a, a new feature of PM sample size, so <clears throat> uh, I've now implemented um, a fixed N uh, approach. So this is again my diagnostic example using um, the example from Thomas de Bray, so presence or absence of DVT. They also presented this table, so I can see we've got a, a fixed N of 1,295 for development. Again, I'm going to use this C statistic. So now we can see <clears throat> PM sample size, type binary, input the C statistic from my reported model, um, and I've got a fixed um, sample size of 1295, so I input the N option instead of um, P, I input an N option. And now it uh, fixes the sample size, so we can see sample size is the same across all criteria, and instead now parameters varies. So I'm now calculating what's the maximum number of parameters that I could estimate given my sample size to meet each of these criteria. We can see in this case again that criteria one wins out, and that's based on the uh, on the shrinkage factor. <clears throat> so here we can see um, we expect to have 285 events given the prevalence in this sample, and the maximum number of predictor parameters that we can estimate in the new model development with this sample that we have to hand is 29 predictive parameters. So um, I have a few slides on external validation, but looking at the time, um, I'm going to skip over those and go to my my final thoughts. Um, so these are just a few thoughts about external validation and some approaches there. Um, but the, the main thing is to say that um, there is more work that is similar to this, um, either published or or soon to be published for external validation. So again, um, we have some closed form solutions, um, some simulation approaches to calculate the sample size that you would need to precisely estimate performance statistics at external validation. So my final thoughts. Um, so until recently, we've we've been ruled by these. Um, rules of thumb or rules of dumb, as Gary would say, uh, 
Um, but really, there's there's no single EPV, and we should be tailoring our sample size to the question. And there is now better methodology available and emerging. And uh, our proposed approach is is implemented in PM sample size, which is quick and easy to use, um, <coughs> and increasing uh, development tasks for PM sample size is to um, increase the number of ways that you can input statistics that are reported in other papers. So more of those R squared values that find their way through the maze to Cox and R squared are being implemented um, in the coming weeks. We're almost there. Um, some potential issues that I just wanted to briefly discuss um, was uh, around shrinkage. So shrinkage is a, a, a really important one and we set that 0.9 value, but I mentioned that that might actually want to be higher and that's because shrinkage is actually estimated with large uncertainty. And so even though we've put in a point estimate of 0.9, it could be that um, that works on average, but not in particular situations. <clears throat> and so we might want to inflate that further. There's issues with our proposal in terms of performance statistics used. So we've already had examples where people are inputting, um, not sure whether they're inputting apparent or adjusted performance values. As I say, that's something I'm working on to make it clear when we input the values, whether we're inputting uh, certain types of statistics. It's obviously open to manipulation like any other sample size um, calculation. You could run the program multiple times with different parameters to find the sample size you wish. Um, I, I, not sure uh, that there's a way around that. And I just wanted to make a plea about, about reporting. So it's really important that when we develop or validate the prediction models that we report some key information and that will really facilitate these um, modern approaches to sample size calculation for the future to make sure we've got better models coming through and better validation studies. So it's really important to describe when you publish your paper um, the number of events, the number of candidate predictors, um, the number of parameters and how you derive your sample size approach. It's really important to uh, present multiple types of um, model performance measures, produce the full um, model, and so the full linear predictor. So if we're talking about time to event models, I want to see the baseline survival hazard at multiple time points. I'd really like to see the distribution of the linear predictor presented more often. That's really a crucial piece of information, particularly when we talk about calculating sample size for external validation and also the range of predictors in your model so we know whether we're extrapolating or not. And so I'm sorry I've gone uh, way over but my, my take home is that sample size is really crucial to avoid overfitting um, particularly in development. We don't need to rely on these old school one size fits all. Um, we can use a more tailored approach and um, please fully report your development and validation studies um, I've shown some clippings throughout, but uh, I've got some references there. And, and thank you very much. And thank you to Richard and Gary and to Kim, Lucy, Glenn and Martin and all the others that are working to, to push us all beyond EPV. Thank you. I'm sorry to gone over quite a lot. Great. Thank you, Troy, for this really interesting presentation and your introduction to sample size calculation. Uh, are there any questions for Joy? You can either type in the chat or just join the presentation. Yes, Vincent. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, I have a question on the selection of your parameters, of your variables. Do you, is there any way how to select them? Or like if you have a lot of parameters available, do you, how do you select the ones that you think are the most valuable? Uh, sorry, I don't know if I, if I followed the question completely, but I think it was around selecting variables. Is it on the slide for selection? Is that right, Daniel? Uh, so I also didn't completely get it. Is it about how you choose a 0 0.9 shrinkage factor? Is this your question? Uh, so it's 
uh, how do you select your event variables, he asked. How do you select your event variables? Um, so you mean as, as in uh, how we select? If we, if we had a fixed sample size, I assume you're saying, how would we um, pare down the variables that we'd like to look at to, to um, be able to produce an adequate model? Um, well, there are a number of ways. Ideally, you base it on um, clinical knowledge of importance of that variable and face validity to, to clinicians and patients, um, existing evidence towards um, the prognostic effect of uh, particular variables, and we could use statistical techniques um, like principal components analysis. Um, uh, we could avoid things like I mentioned, we could um, avoid things like exploring complex nonlinear um, shapes because that will increase the number of parameters we're looking at. Um, but yeah, really, it would be good if it was guided by um, clear information from clinicians and from previous evidence. I'm not sure if that's exactly the question you were asking. I'm sorry. OK, thanks. Sorry, Dan, you were, you're on mute, I think. Sorry, there is another question from Tink. I don't know if I pronounced it correct, which I expected. Any guidance on sample size calculation for deep learning neural network approach for prediction modeling? <laughs> probably can ask for machine learning in general because I also hear this question <laughs> always. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer because um, I, I haven't dabbled a lot in, in machine learning myself. Um, it's one of those things that. Um, it, it looks it's like a polar bear. It looks amazing and fascinating, but I'm afraid that if I get too close to it, it will eat me alive. Um, but what I will say is that I think that our sample size guidance could be used um, as a minimum, definitely as a minimum, because I expect that sample size for um, deep learning and machine learning approaches will be higher than our minimum from our calculations. Um, I expect that because there is some existing evidence, so there's a paper by um, van der Plug that's shown that, that these methods are really data hungry. Um, and I also think that uh, it, it's based a lot on, on the parameters. That um, some of these models have um, hidden layers and split variables uh, through stages, and that will just increase the number of parameters that we're looking to estimate. And so I think we'll naturally have inflated sample size beyond uh, that baseline that would come out of our program. Oh, muted again, Daniel. <laughs> Who is muting? Okay, thank you. But this also refer to regularized regression. So if you have got shrinkage and your shrink, if you would shrink using regularized regression, you might need slightly less power smaller sample size well that would be my question yeah well i think the issue there is um you would think that but uh as as i, I alluded to but i didn't really have time to go into yet there's some big issues around the fact that that shrinkage um is only shrinking things on average so you might see that not actually got um, an accurate model when it starts to evaluate performance in, in individuals or in specific types of patients because that shrinkage is only worked on average. And in fact, if we were to estimate a confidence interval, for example, around that level of shrinkage, then it would be quite large, um, which is why I was alluding to the fact that we might have been quite uh, liberal in saying use a 0.9 threshold and that perhaps it should be quite a bit higher. Um, <laughs> but again, as I say, uh, some people on the call probably know more than me about these uh, machine learning approaches. <laughs> it's definitely an, an, an ever evolving field. I know that there are more people looking at it. Um, I know, uh, yeah, 
for example, yeah, I know there are papers that are under review now that are looking at it. Okay, thank you. So I seem to cause an echo. Uh, <laughs> so I'm muted all the time. But are there any other questions? There's one question which we probably can't answer from Nelson. He asks, is it possible to go through the skipped external validation section after the questions? If there's time, please, I guess it would be too much to ask you, but perhaps <laughs> for next session in. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to stay if you if you want. Um, well, perhaps you should just have another. Yeah, invite you another time. I, I mean, perhaps. Just, um, yeah, perhaps uh, I can record this separately and, and put it up on Richard's website. That would be great. Great. Uh, are there any other questions for Joey? Okay, they ask. Oh, they ask if the well, we, is it okay if you uh, uh, present the recordings on our web page and if we can get your slides? Because there were several questions about it. If they can get the slides or the recordings, so we recorded it, and if you are happy with it, we will upload it on the BRC Prediction Modeling Group web page, and I will send an link around with by with Twitter. This yeah. is fine with you. Okay, if there are any last question, anybody? If there's anybody? If not, then thanks a lot again, Joey, for this really interesting presentation and for this great piece of software. So I used it. Uh, yeah. and it's really easy and it was very helpful to hear your guidance about selecting the parameters and so so i think that's very helpful okay thanks a lot thank you and thanks, a, thanks a lot everybody for attending yes thank you all <laughs>